So, uh, I had I had the wrong impression going into this series um, because basically what had been told about um, the the British version of House of Cards is that like, oh, it's it's better than the American version. It's more subtle. Uh, but I don't know. Like I didn't. I haven't seen the American version, so I can't say anything about about that. Mm-hmm. But I didn't really feel like it's this not was... that subtle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it starts with uh, you know uh, the the protagonist or the antagonist uh, breaking the fourth wall, and, and he does that over and over again. Oh yes, that that is the trademark of the show. But I, I make that comparison because guess how the U.S. House of Cards opens. Uh, isn't it similar to this? Just a breaking the fourth wall again? Um, no, no, no. I mean, it is breaking the fourth wall, but it involves the main character walking into a darkly lit night where <laughs> there's a dog lying uh, that got hit by a car lying on the ground. And he he breaks the dog's neck, narrating how how this is what's necessary to be done, and that if you don't have the guts to do this, then you're not a good politician. <laughs> That's the yeah. opening. Okay, okay, I, I, I can kind of see why people would think that the British one is more. Uh, I mean, I guess there's some slightly more subtle stuff visually, like uh, the well, rats, for example. That you it's see. all. It's also more focused, uh, like, the, the the first, this one takes, like, one, four episodes to go over, uh, to go over the entire bit for power, and it's very focused. The U.S. Netflix one meanders. Like, you've got two or three seasons to get into power, and the other thing is, like, the process of uh, of the main character getting to power in the U.S. one just doesn't make sense. Because the idea of, oh, scandal-ridden, therefore I as president resign, has only happened once in, uh, in American history ever. That was Nixon. Uh, and most of these scandals like really aren't, don't rise to the level of something that a president would actually resign over. The only reason Nixon resigned was that he was facing potential criminal charges and me thought better for the country not to have that go through. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I, I guess, uh, I mean, this was, um, so House of Cards originally was a novel. Uh, it written... originally was novel. Yeah. yeah. And it, it was written by uh, a former advisor uh, to Margaret Thatcher um, and I think he was also chief, chief of the party, which I'm not sure if, if that's the same thing as the chief whip uh, position. But he he he, he was, uh, and um, now I think he um, he's in the house. Uh, his name is M- Michael Dobbs. Uh, mm-hmm. Michael Dobbs. Uh, he's in the House of Lords now, sitting okay. on on the conservative side, um, and um, he voted in favor of. Um, this was around 2006 or something like that. He waited voted in, uh, in favor of um, the same sex marriage, um, legalizing yeah, it. Yeah, 2013 the, couples. 2013, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he he seems to be a pretty standard uh, centrist toy as it goes. Yeah. Um, I think uh, it all. I'm just <laughs> this is stuff you can find in the wiki, of course. Um, um, and. Uh, he he's also it was also part of some he's also part of some committee uh, for um, sending back uh, the pieces of the Parthenon um, in the British Museum back to Greece. Yeah. Um, so that's mo- the more left wing part, and the only right right wing thing which I could find about him, I guess, was that he uh, voted in favor of uh, of a bill. Uh, he, he, or, no, uh, or rather, he, he was in favor of leaving the European Union. Let's say. Yeah. Well, well, um, welcome to the Tory Party. <laughs> um, I mean, um, I to be honest, I wouldn't have been su- surprised. I mean, if this was written by someone in New Labour, uh, because yeah, it this wouldn't ca- have surprised me either. No. 
this came out in the in the um, 90s, right? So yeah, though uh, technically, yeah, the book was written. The movie, uh, the show came out in 1990, and the book came out uh, a couple years before then. Uh, yeah. So it f- technically would predate uh, New Labor and its existence. Yeah, I mean, it it, it totally fails to predict it. I, I guess you could say because yeah. uh, the op- the opposition, the Labor Party, doesn't play any part. Yeah, um, Labor doesn't play a significant part. What's interesting is that the second season actually involves the death of uh, Queen Elizabeth, and that's a major plot point. And it's like. <laughs> Guess who only just croaked now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but, but that's one of those things of, hey, you, you can't possibly know when. when and, yeah, exactly. Uh, and it made for a good story. So uh, who cares? Yeah, I'm not, I'm, not sh- I'm not sure whether the sequels... Um, so there's, there's three series. We are not talking about the first one today. But I'm not sure if, if the subsequent ones were actually based on a novel on the novel, or if they were originals. Um, uh, I'm not, not as clear on that either. Yeah. Anyways, the show starts... Uh, well, if you want to uh, lead in with any more of your thoughts, go ahead. Um, well, I mean, I guess I was... I mean, I have had other comments, but I have nothing um, it, exactly to lead into it, I guess. Uh, so you can go first. Okay, yeah, it seems they were based off of subsequent sequel novels. But House of Cards opens with... It's this, uh, it gives this very posh intro with, uh, with trumpets and a very regal feel as we follow in, and we get introduced to Francis Urquhart. And this man is the chief whip of the Tory party, and he is eminently polite and dignified and almost regal in a way. And even the other politicians note, oh, he he might be a little bit of a muckraker, but he'd never stab you in the back. There's very few politicians like that anymore. And he, he... he gets elected to the... Uh, the conservatives have just been elected to another majority, a somewhat slim majority. And he is brought in to number 10 Downing to discuss uh, cabinet positions and whatnot. And he is rather rudely informed by his new prime minister that he will not be granted the... <laughs> position that he was promised in the cabinet because they prefer him in a chief whip position and they basically have no direct attempt to compensate him for this broken promise and he is absolutely furious there's this great uh there's this great shot uh, of him squeezing his fists together angrily under the under the table while he says, you're much too kind, Prime Minister. Much too kind. Uh, And it cuts to him exploding at his wife, uh, going, saying, melodramatic twaddle. He says that his fate was in his my hand. And his wife, who is the consummate Lady Macbeth, she comes behind him, starts rubbing his shoulders, isn't he? Isn't his fate in your hand? And she starts introducing the idea to him of, hmm, aren't there ways that you could take him down? He is a weak leader, you know. And so that sets this whole bit in motion, is a mixture of his own ambition, and the fact that uh, this PM, Michael Collingridge, is very much a liberal toy who 
doesn't exactly have the strongest reputation nor the strongest political skills. Yeah. Um, yeah, go on. Yeah, and one of the things that does feel incisive about the show sometimes is the main character... Francis Stork, it always feels a little bit above things, always a little bit outside of it. Uh, and he, he, he's very much the old, um, a toy from like a wealthy background who Ken is more temperamentally conservative. He doesn't have any real principles, I'd say. But he likes to play at them, and he has a temperamental disgust for someone like a Michael Collingridge, which uh, I I think is easy for a lot of people to relate to. He he's once describes him as the man who only has a desire to be liked, a useful tr attribute in a spaniel or a whore. I mean, to be honest, Urquhart um, sort of um, sounds like a middle-class uh, left-wing person's um, idea of uh, somebody who is in the upper class. I mean, not, I'm not saying that people like Urquhart yes. don't exist on the right. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess uh, we could explain what the uh, what party whip means. Uh, basically, what it means is uh, <laughs> it, it's pretty literal um, <laughs> as well, um, not subtle at all. Um, you know, but basically, the party whip's job is to make sure that uh, the, the the ministers are all on the um, on the government's uh, side, yeah. uh, essentially, or rather, oh, the prime I, minister's side. Uh, I give the I keep the troops in line. I give them a little stick, make them jump, uh, as he says. Yeah, I mean, uh, earlier you asked me for a leading in thoughts, um, and I had one, which I was planning to say, but I forgot, which is the first thing about uh, the series is, uh, how, how do you pronounce, uh, how do you pronounce the name? Um, because, okay. I mean, it, yeah, Urquhart, yeah, I mean, uh, um, I, I thought it was an unusual name, but when I looked it up, um, it turns out it's a Scottish name, and well, there's a, there's a whole lot of people, famous people, with that surname, which means that it's maybe not that rare as I felt. Oh, yes, yes. It, 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 it's uh, it, it's uh, a name pretty common in Britain, but it's just one of those names which, like, you're not finding it anywhere in America, so it makes them very quintessentially British. Yeah, it seems mostly. I'm looking at at the list. It's mostly mostly Scottish, Canadian, Australian, British. Uh, there's a few Americans, but not that many. Yeah. Um. Right. Um. And one of the things that uh, Francis Urquhart just sort of stumbles upon by happenstance is a reporter, this young little thing, young blonde reporter, very feisty, the, the type that fancies herself a real reporter back in the day when you had such people. Uh, she, she talks to Francis Urquhart and uh, she shows up at his house and unusually Francis decides to let her in. He basically says, well, you, you've come at a good time. This is... And he decides to make use of her because he's planning to unseat his prime minister. So, uh, suddenly granting her access and giving her very limited stories is something that can be useful to her. And there's this constant dynamic between her, she's the outsider, and she's constantly trying to break in and understand what's going on inside the party and what on earth these people are saying at party conferences because it's all written in code. It's all very much standard 
political ease statement of all uh, of all sort. And this is back in the era. I suppose this is a little bit like this in British politics. It's fading out in American politics, where a- everything was coded to be quite polite. Hmm. Um, I don't know. Um, I mean, I mean, British politics uh, has uh, has kind of a um, reputation of being not being very polite, but. Um, True, oh, yeah. you always have uh, Prime Minister's questions, which does show up here. Yeah, uh, whereas I think by comparison, um, American politics um, is was at least supposed to be <laughs> more polite. I'm not sure whether that's... Well, it's uh... an interesting comparison. You don't have Prime Minister's questions. And the thing is, the congressional talks tend to be very stultified, overly polite, and not much happens there. But uh, Some of those advertisements, for example, have seen, though, um, like, I think think it's, um, uh, like, like I don't see people insulting their opposition or or other other candidates that they're running against in advertisements, where I believe that that's a thing. In the United States, although I don't know how for for how long, like like TV advertisements where like they will shit talk. <laughs> the yeah, ad- t- I, yeah, TV advertisements going after the opposition directly are a standard in U.S. politics. Goes back forever. Uh, has been very ex- extraordinarily common. Um, they tend to define themselves quite negatively in terms of this guy is worse. Uh, that tends to be the way most campaigns are run. Uh, oftentimes, like scare, scare, scare ones where, like, if someone makes like any unoptical vote on anything, oh, you voted for the free candy for children bill that secretly was going to uh, sterilize children. <laughs> How could you be against free candy for children? <laughs> this guy is against free candy for children. <laughs> and you'll see a lot of ads like that. Yeah, I mean, um, so I, I, I guess one problem which I did notice in this series, maybe you didn't feel as much, um, and I think this also contrasts to what you said about the uh, uh, the U.S. series is that he, here I kind of f- found the problem a little bit that because everything happened so fast, um, everything was kind of easy for it, it seemed like very easy for Urquhart to just mess up uh, one guy after the other. So I didn't really care about the, them that much at all because it seemed pretty easy. To, uh, whereas I don't know how the U.S. series was, but. Um, the U.S. one is dragged out and doesn't make you feel any more like uh, a ca- feeling for any character besides Frank Underwood. Frank Underwood, compared to Francis Urquhart, like Francis Urquhart, he has this respectable clout to him, and he feel he doesn't think he's a, a there, there's anything wrong with him. He just thinks he's strong and does what's necessary. Whereas, like, Frank Underwood in the U.S. version, he revels in the fact that, like, I would wade through mountains of blood in order to uh, in order to make my way up the political sphere. And anyone who doesn't is an, abs- uh, is an absolute sucker. And, and they're all fools. And I am such a... Pr- Superior Machiavellian. Ah! <laughs> That's what the yeah, it's a, it's a, I don't know, it's called Gia style, I guess. Uh, oh, um, it, it is much more obnoxious than that than Code Gias. Um, I mean, if if there is one transparent ca- caricature in this uh, series, it would be uh, the the man who runs the uh, Matty's newspaper. Um, I can't remember Ben the, Landless. Yes. Yeah. He he is oh, yeah. trans, yeah, and it's interesting. The show tries to make it as something of a hit piece. The fact that Ben Landless 
is really just this uh, corrupt newspaper mogul who basically is the, the, the type of guy who goes, okay, you, you want me, uh, my paper's going to say whatever I want it to say, like screw the reporting, and I'm going to cut it, uh, buddy up with whoever is going to give me a good position in the government and give my newspaper and my business interests uh, a fair shot. And like anyone who doesn't, like I don't care. It's like yeah, it, it, it's it's one of those bits where like in the '90s that was a shocking idea. Today, like no one's shocked by it. Like th that that's almost like a standard ploy. I mean, you look at. Washington Post or The Guardian. Like, imagine The Guardian saying anything nice about the Tories. I mean, even then, people understood I mean, that, like, the, that the newspapers in Britain like, yeah, yeah, exactly. aligned with a, a, a certain party. Yeah, I mean, if you have seen the skit in uh, Yes Minister, which I believe came out before this, mm -hmm. but, or maybe around the same time, where you have, like, um, like, one like what it, it's a it's a joke what one character just explaining um you know like s saying that for example the guardian is uh is written by people who think that they ought to run the country uh the the daily mail is, uh the daily daily is read by people who the, the wives of the people who who run the country and so on and, and so yeah forth. and there was yeah. one where it was like so and so is written uh, is read by the people who uh, who think that another country runs the government. Yeah, I think that uh, was and, the, the, the Daily Vic or something like that. Probably. Yeah, and, and then it's like, but what about the Sun readers? Oh, readers <laughs> of the Sun don't care as long as she has big tits. Yeah, and that's because um, <laughs> and I, I, I guess they I, got for, rid of it. They got, yeah, they got rid, rid of it in the past three yeah, years. Yeah, that's so, only... so, so iconic. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing people remember about the, uh, about the sun, the fact that they 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 have a nude woman uh, on like page two, page three, page, page three. three. They, they, page they, they used to they used to call them uh, page three girls uh, for a reason. Um, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So I guess we're getting back to the series. Um. But yeah, the what makes the what what makes the show work is you have Frank Underwood, uh, uh, Francis Arcus, and unlike <laughs> Frank Underwood, uh, he he only narrates sparingly. He he narrates from time to time, giving you his general thoughts, and usually it's to describe some of the other leaders and it can be very cathartic the way he does where he describes these leaders like the oh during one of the leader times when he when another politician is running for the leadership and he says like he's going to say com uh compassionate uh principled and thoughtly all in a single sentence i bet you <laughs> and sure enough, he does. <laughs> and, and, and it can be really quite likable because he, this is a man who really does understand the political situation and has a the way the political game is run and he has a proper contempt for it. And, and, and so there's a certain degree to which you, you, you find yourself laughing alongside him uh, at uh, some of these politicians. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I did find myself rooting for him sometimes. Mm. I don't know about you. Oh yeah, it, it, it's easy too, and especially if you're more right leaning. He is basically him and Patrick Walton are basically the two one right leaning ones that end up going uh, to the Tory party. I mean, and, and f about Patrick, but. Uh, in one of those, uh, you know, um, fourth wall breaking monologues, um, doesn't Urquhart kind of complain about uh, Patrick being a racist or, or whatever? Yes, he is a, uh, a lout, a, a 
a racist and anti-Semite. Yeah, uh, I can't... which I mean, hmm. I don't know. I kind of feel like uh, the amount of people with any sort of tendencies like that would have been drummed out uh, of the Tory Party by the eighties with the uh, with the loss of uh, oh, what's his name? The the man who attempted to do something about immigration. Liking up his name, but it's quite possible there were a number of cowards in there who just like didn't bring it up, uh, especially back in the eighties. Yeah, I, I guess uh, would that be something that Hurt Her- 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 actually says, or was that just the author's voice uh, slipping? It was the author's contempt, but like I, I feel like that's something Hurt Her- would say. There's always been a great deal of. Pe- uh, peoples who see see themselves especially as being very anti-racist. And it's all very droll. It's very low class of these people to, to have such views. Yeah, I, I, yeah, because I think P- Patrick, whatever his surname is, um, was sort of more of the pro-business kind of candidate, whereas I'm not sure whether... I mean, I wouldn't say that Urquhart is anti-business from what I've seen, but um, he's more pro old money as opposed to new money. Let's say old money, uh. an old Tory, yes. But he, but he's very much willing to do business with uh, the new deregulation. And, and there, and there's the these uh, scenes where he's talking to Ben Landless, where you you tell you can tell this is a guy trying. The author is trying to attack perceived deregulation at the time during Margaret Thatcher stuff, where. But Francis Orchid is talking about this used to be a place for heroes, Ben. Explorers, merchant adventurers. Like, he's really quite a good politician. Uh, and it's actually interesting where, on the one hand, you can go, okay, yeah, this guy is quite cynically talking about it. But, like, man, this is, like, more red meat than like any politician dare says today and it's kind of refreshing in a way (laughs) that's one of those things where it's like this is supposed to be a critique but things are just so bad now it comes across as refreshing yeah yeah Uh, yeah i mean i guess uh if some lefty were to to hear us uh, talk about it then like uh, oh look uh (laughs) The, 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 real, the real face uh, is showing. <laughs> That's what they really want. They look, I'm not, I, look, I'm not saying that he isn't saying it cynically and that his idea of, like, heroism is just, like, oh, the big guys get... Uh, uh, that his, his newspaper man get, uh, gets uh, corrupt dealings and, oh, it's just a slight amount of deregulation here which is really going to get the let the newspapers buy in. Like, yeah, I'm not saying that any of this is something good or something very useful. Yeah. But what I am, but what I, but what I am saying is that to even talk in, in such a way, to, 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 to even make a go of, uh, 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 of supporting like such a people that would try and go their own way it, it, it is quite refreshing in the modern era. Um. So, so this came out at at a period when uh, Britain was a little bit less less diverse, but there's still some. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. It's interesting. This is the period in which Britain was starting to ape the U.S. Uh, and so you quite uh pointedly have uh uh this this uh black woman who serves as the uh, as basically the partner of this chief guy in the toy party who's very good at propaganda and stuff like that uh mr o'neill and and, and mr o- o- o'neill he he's this type who's got a drug problem he's very much uh kind of a humble working class background type guy you get the feeling he, he's the type of guy who's easily manipulated quite naive uh, uh, i'm not sure it's... i'm not sure whether i mean don't they talk about uh, his school days 
implying that um like i don't know he went to eton or something um yeah well that's true yeah yeah i think you're right uh, that he did go to like some sort of higher class schools. You're, you're right. Yeah. You're right. But but he still has that sort of like feeling about him. He's definitely not the smartest tack in the shed. Uh, but but he he's I, yeah. The, the feeling that I got was that he was supposed to be like this o- overgrown boy who who had like his best days uh, back when he was um, at in Eton school. or whatever in school. Yes, at but, Eden. Uh, basically, like, um, like, like the bad guy in the Great Gatsby, whatever his name was, I can't remember now. Um, but, but he, like, he, ha- he has because he had it easy or whatever. He, ha- he hasn't uh, matured or something like that. I think that's what they were going with his character. Um, yeah, possible. Um, uh, uh, yeah, go on. The the one thing I'll go for, uh, I'll say is they make it uh, quite clear with him uh, that they have a certain... Like, all, all, all the character They make it with Francis Urquhart and his ploys. They show both that his ploys are quite intelligent, but he's also constantly taking a risk. Like, he talks to his other candidates uh to to other people inside the Tory party uh about what uh about what should be done he starts leaking different press materials to the press and especially to Maddie and like at any point he could have come under suspicion and uh Francis Urquhart simply gets behind it by instead insinuating uh the idea that uh, Michael Collingridge's uh, like closest advisor, the idea that he wa- wa- wants his protege to take over in the party. Yeah, I mean it, it's like like it's more psychological rather than like a like a forty uh, yeah chess plan where like you can't even follow what what the fuck is going on. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. that's what the US one is like, but the UK one no, it's quite straightforward, uh, uh, and he's really relying on his own personal charm, especially towards the Prime Minister, and the fact that, uh, uh, as his rival actually said, he has, this, he has this impression that this man would never stab you in the back. It's, yeah. you, you get the impression this is the type of man who hadn't done such a thing, had never needed to do such a thing, and yeah. now is just uh, cashing in all his chips now. Uh, uh, you know, um, earlier on, before we started recording, um, and we were talking about the name Ben, and you said Ben Landler, Landless. Um, like mm-hmm. I, I thought that it didn't, like it didn't uh, register that you were talking about the fat journalist, uh, or rather the fat newspaper owner. I thought yeah. you were making you, you were making a joke about no, Ben no. Shapiro <laughs> <laughs> being Landless. Landless. Um, oh, that'd be a strange <laughs> joke. Um, yes. So, um, about the race stuff. Um, so with the with the black girl. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean that's that's just uh, that's just reminiscent of this period in British history where they wanted to show that there were very few black people in Britain, like less than 1% at this point, but they purposely put her in there because they, they want to show that they're very modern and all that, and that everyone's yeah. integrated. So it, it's, it's one of those things where her race is not particularly relevant, except in the idea that she is a somewhat exotic ingenue and that she's somewhat desirable because of that. Yeah, um, I mean... She ends up sleeping with, uh, or rather, the racist uh, Patrick. Yeah, what Patrick, uh, Patrick Walton. Yeah, yes. a, and basically, yeah, Mister uh, Mr. O'Neill, uh, Francis Orchid suggests that uh, to Mister o- O'Neill as a way to get leverage on Walton because because Walton ends up being like Francis Orchid's like greatest threat uh, he he sees him as like he he's like the only one of his competitors who's like 
intelligent and all there in the head. Yeah. <laughs> so and, so uh, he's got to get dirt on him somehow. Yeah. Um, and there's also another scene um, with another one, with one of the competitors which gets kicked out pretty, pretty soon. The, I think it's the healthcare candidate. Um, and like he's, he's driving some uh, to some um, laboratory uh, to, to talk about, to talk with some scientist for a f- uh, who who invented something um, and um, you know it, you know and um, uh, he, he the scientist has a um, an an Indian name right um, so um, this candidate then uh, says oh, so he, he it's an Indian name isn't it and uh, I guess he said why. So they're they're going there in a car, um, and they're they're about to be trapped uh, by one of um, Urquhart's schemes. But anyway, the advisor comments that uh, no, it's not. It's not an Indian. Uh, it's uh, mm-hmm. you know they were born um, in Britain, so that uh, so they're so they're British. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, you, you remember that scene or? No, no, I don't think I particularly remember it. No. Yeah, but. Either way, uh, you have. It, it should also be mentioned that this is one of those old BBC, BBC shows where it's quite impeccably directed. And the other thing that has it is it really has the feel of politics down to a T, and, and and it always has the tone is absolutely pitch perfect in this where. You, you always have this vein of respectability, of simpleness. There's very little music in the show at all. Uh, and there's only occasionally, uh, only occasional pieces. One, one thing they play up a little bit is uh, when Francis Urquhart is going, uh, has something going well for him, he starts humming uh, the ride of the Valkyries expectantly. <laughs> <laughs> There's little bits like that. And the other major risk, which ends up somewhat unraveling in Urquhart's face, is uh, under a fake identity, he pretends to be uh, Prime Minister Michael Collingwood's brother and do some insider trading. Yeah, and... o- 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 honestly, the only thing which he did which was sort of funny, like, is this real for real? Like, was him put, putting on some uh, a fake mustache and then calling and a, it? Uh, uh, yeah, a, a, fake, a yeah. fake mustache and a pair of glasses and walking in uh, with like a little bit of a fake tan. It's like, oh, of course, Mister Collingridge. <laughs> but yeah. It, yeah, it's it's one of those things where like that wouldn't work as well in the modern era where everyone can like just look up a person's face but back in like the 90s where where whether or not you got your face in the yeah. paper or not was very unlikely it's like no you definitely could like i mean half something like that even if it's a little hokey yeah, I, I, I think i think this this was because before he became like a, a candidate as well so yes yeah. the, yes uh francis circuit at this point was someone who would be very well known to people inside the Tory party, but outside of the Tory party, he was not particularly known. And in fact, one of the, one of the lines that I like is Ben Landless says, we got to build you up. Who's going to vote for Mr. Francis Urquhart from nowhere? Am I right? And you can tell that Francis is like very insulted, but at the same time, he calmly takes it because, to a certain degree, he, he knows it's true. Yeah, he, he knows it's true. Yeah, and, and, and like Francis Urquhart, as far as this goes, he's not like a Gary Stu or something like, or not like an evil Gary Stu or something like that. He 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 is not impeccably well known. He's not one hundred percent the most savvy operator. He makes mistakes and he has to take risks in order to make his way up yeah but yeah. another thing I, I guess which shows the age of this would be um because with, with a lot of stuff um you don't really notice it but um 
uh, for example, he makes phone calls pretending to be somebody else with his with his own phone, mm-hmm. um, which obviously couldn't do uh, in the in the modern age. Um, okay. Yeah, and uh, well, I mean, this is not actually re- relevant to anything, but um, um, I, I do like the computers because they get they do get uh, featured the old computers um, mm-hmm. with. Um, uh, the, I, I, how would you describe? And I wouldn't describe them as black and white screens, but um, uh, like for example, uh, I noticed that uh, the the program, uh, one of the programs that they were using for the article to write the articles is WordStar, which I believe that is is the same program that um, the guy who wrote um, what's, what was it called um, uh, that fantasy, violent fantasy TV series. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, with dragons, um, and I, uh, and had a shitty ending. Um, oh, in, what you mean? Uh, you mean Game of Thrones? Yes, yes, yeah. I, I, the 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 author still uses words. Uh, the same the same program which they use. Um, oh, yeah. I, I didn't know that. I yeah. didn't know that. I, I can see a certain utility of that in terms of. Locking out disruptions. Yeah, and it it looks cool to me anyway. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah, no, sense. no, I understand that it has a certain retro appeal to it. Absolutely. Yeah. And you do get to see that uh, them using computers a few times because of the prote- of Matty, the prote- uh, the rather the journalist, um, and um, yeah, in, in some other scenes like that. Uh, okay, now that I've totally derailed the, the conversation, <laughs> talking about nineties <laughs> and eighties computers. Uh, let's get get back. Um, so the on there's one more there's one more um I guess non-white character, uh, which I don't think they would get away with these days probably. Um, oh, so one of the constituents in um. Um, in in, oh, in the yeah. I don't. Uh, I think it was. I don't know what he he was. I I almost got the. Uh, he could have been like Arab. Uh, he he could have been like on the border regions. I I don't know what he was, but he like donates some money to Francis Urquhart, uh, and you can tell he's like one of these people from outside Great Britain, where he's like. Oh, but I want to give this donation to you. You, you are my minister, uh, Mister Rocket. I like you, uh, and it's like <laughs> he, he can tell he comes from one of these places where like bribery is just a matter of course, and, and like this isn't really acceptable in the British system. But like from where he comes from originally, it's like, oh, this is just. Yeah, I mean, do things, I, I, and why would yeah. you do it this way? <laughs> and, I mean, and, and it's a little precocious in a way, and it's kind of likable and enjoying. Yeah, I think the, the impression I got it, it, in that it was maybe like some business um, owner who owner. got. Yeah, yeah, who, it, it, he, he was someone obviously who has a lot of money. Yeah, some business guy yeah. who, who uh, probably who got rich rich in the UK by selling alcohol or something like that. I imagine. Something in his like in his constituency, probably. Uh, okay. Um, what else is there to say? Um, uh, speaking of Urquhart's tactics, um, um, one of the things um, which maybe some American viewers might, might not get, or maybe some non-British viewers might not get, is uh, why is it that uh, they all because he uh, Urquhart bugs um uh, bugs um um the the red bu- the um, a red suitcase and leaves it in Patrick Patrick's Wilton's Bul- uh, room um and why is it that he happens to have the same um uh, red su- red box right um is because uh, uh those those are the ones which I've used um, in the British government. Um, oh, okay. I yeah, and, that. and like when the Chancellor of the Czech, um, like when he he he, he 
uh, the class the class or rather brings the um, the the new budget usually it's it's in one of those red boxes um or at yes. least yeah it yes. used to be, it used to be that way and now i think like it's more it's more of a symbolic thing you now they just send it over the computer or something rather than yeah yeah this which is, is yeah this is one of those shows which is very politically well informed like the us one as contrast has the scene where frank underwood explodes at a congressman for like oh you included pork in your bill how could you do this and it's like get fucking real uh, but the, 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 there's nothing like that in the UK one. It's all ve- very two period, all very pretty much very reflective of how how things are actually done. And, and like the tone, which I keep mentioning and I harping on, it feels like an avenue at Prime Minister's questions. In, in fact when they do have, like, some actual Prime Minister's questions, it doesn't feel any different from, like, a standard yeah. uh, Prime Minister's question. Yeah, so just go and look, look up one on YouTube. It's uh, very similar, exactly. Yes. And I, I'm not sure, but maybe the BBC got permission to actually film inside the Houses of Parliament, because it didn't oh. look... It didn't look like a movie set, at least. Yeah, me. no, it's it's possible that they did. I really don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's possible because the BBC is a state-run, yeah, corporation, exactly. But, but anywho, uh, uh, Francis Urquhart, uh, this is, we'll be getting into spoilerish territories, but I mean, whatever, it's an old show, and I think most people know the premise. Uh, the... Uh, Francis Urquhart ends up being able to outmaneuver the Prime Minister. One of the brilliant things is he advises the Prime Minister in just the perfect way uh, to to not ta- uh, speak on this controversy about his brother until the last five minutes. Just brush it under him. And, and, and he phrases it so well to make it seem like this will be just a way to ignore it and show that you're underneath it, uh, you're over this, whatnot. And then instead, what uh, what happens is a new bit of revelation on the story is dropped on the prime minister, and, uh, and the prime minister just doesn't know how to handle it, and he comes out like a doddering mess, <laughs> and then it cuts. Then. <laughs> Uh, and that's the end of the TV broadcast, and that's when the prime minister chooses to resign. Is it get? Yeah. And even yeah. after, uh, even after all of that, uh, doesn't towards, doesn't uh, suspect Urquhart in the slightest. No, he he talks to Urquhart about how mm, how uh, he, uh, about how much he values his friendship and that he would support him in the candidacy. Uh, even and, th- even though and Urquhart smiles, knowing that uh, his support uh, doesn't really <laughs> matter much, anyway, no. count for much, anyway. No, of point. course it doesn't. Yeah, um, of course it doesn't. But yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it, 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 he he really plays it well, and, and he okay has the scene where he says, "Oh, you have any pity?" Uh, Get rid of it now. Grind it under your boot like old cigar butts. Uh, again, they, they, the writing, like not just the actual plot writing, but also the dialogue is very snappy, very witty, and, and very well done. Uh, but that, that aside, one of the things that also works there is it's one of those scenes where you... Although Michael Collingridge is like actually a very weak prime minister, and to a certain degree you feel that okay, something like this was inevitable. At the same time, you feel a great deal of sympathy for him because, like, Francis Urquhart has just shown absolute zero loyalty. He he he's prayed one of the cardinal virtues of like loyalty to one's lord, you might say. And you really do feel 
sorry for the prime minister in a way, and, and it and it and it works really well because you don't feel particularly sorry for him until that moment. Up until then, he comes across as a little obnoxious, a loud, stupid. Not stupid, but like unwise and all that type of stuff. Uh, uh, and then you get to there, and it's like you feel kind of bad for him. Uh, uh, and it's a great way the show can just play with your expectations. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, uh, and uh, you know, like it. It also makes you wonder, like m m maybe, maybe Urquhart has a point, and it's it's better for them to be out mm -hmm. <laughs> for him and his brother to be out out of. Um, Politics, mm. um, but obviously that's not true. But <laughs> not that, not that way. Um, yeah, way, yeah. Um, but, oh, yeah, yeah. And then what starts to unravel for him is as the prime minister resigns, uh, announces his resignation, and people start looking for a way up in the party. The story uh, going into the backroom dealings of Prime Minister's brother drops. And Maddie, who was reporting on this, instantly finds this incredibly suspicious. There's the background of, like, the fact that Michael Collingridge's brother is, like, kind of not particularly intelligent, a drunkard, and, and just sort of a very nice fellow and, and maddie like goes and talks to him and she like immediately intuits that this this man could not have done this yet all the data seems to be prim and proper for this so what's going on and and, and all the newspapers are like totally uninterested in this and, and you see actually an interesting turning point where if things had simply continued on as was going on, she wouldn't have had many leads. She would have been just dismissed about it, and she would have, uh, and she wouldn't have had anywhere to go, and it would have been rejected by the press, and that probably would have been the end of it. But instead, Tip O'Neill panics, and and, and uh, uh, well, not Tip O'Neill, Mister O'Neill. I'm getting confused with the American politician. Uh, he panics and he uh, and he tries to intimidate Maddie at, with this like little bit of blood. It's like, if you don't stop looking, we'll hurt your pretty face. Uh, and drops that message on her car, along with like partially destroying it. And that's the point where Maddie gets like really shooken up. But she also gets really obsessed with it at this point. She she's the type of person who's like naturally curious. She can't overlook it. And it's at this point she's already gotten into a relationship with Francis Urquhart. Uh, okay. <laughs> Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> what that that yeah yeah there yeah there's that's definitely one of the bits where they try and show the perversity. Uh, are Francis Urquhart, and they uh, and they don't try and dwell on it too much, but uh, they they definitely try and lean into it a little by having her call him daddy. He goes like, "What?" And he's a little and taken she, she's, aback by it. Yeah, she's the one who suggests it uh, suggests it as well. Oh yeah, uh, she. It, she's very much the young up and comer type who's very ambitious. Uh, I, I think she's doing well, but she she sees of herself as like I do what I uh, what I want uh, and what I please, uh, and she's like very naturally attracted to power as a young woman. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, that didn't the the friend zone the beauty or whatever his position was uh, say that uh, call it Kissinger syndrome or whatever. I, I never had had never heard that term before, but apparently I, I hadn't heard it either. <laughs> I I actually like what they're doing with uh, the deputy character after uh, his uh, after uh, 
Maddie gets intimidated and he is there comforting her, you get the impression that he could actually have scored with her if he was just like a little bit less resentful. But his his resentfulness towards like uh, uh, other men is kind of really a turn off, and it sort of prevents that. Yeah, I found an article by the New the New York Times called uh, "The Abroad at Home: The Kissinger Kissinger, Kissinger Syndrome." Um, anyway. Yeah, but, but uh, and by uh, by this by Kissinger uh, syndrome, um, this guy, this I can't even remember his name. Uh, I, uh, uh, does he feature at all in the sequels? By the way, um, Henry Kissinger, no, n- no, no, not Kiss- Henry Kissinger. The the for lack of a better term, the the friend zone guy. Um, yeah, uh, I don't. I don't think so. I, I don't recall, but I don't think so. I okay, don't think okay. he's relevant. Uh, yeah. you do, but anyways, Mr. O'Neill starts to, uh, Maddie starts, is undeterred and starts pressuring him, and he, and he starts panicking. He starts telling him to Francis Urquhart that they're going to uncover all this info about the fact that they falsified the data on this insider trading deal, this supposed insider trading deal, at, at uh, uh, and this great scene where he's like, but I'm not going to be a gentleman about this. I, uh, If I'm going down, I'm going to spill it. Uh, and Francis just grabs his shoulders and goes, no one's going to spill anything. No one's going down. I'm going to come out of this with a knighthood, Roger. A knighthood. Uh, 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 and he, like, you can tell at that point Orchid has decided that he's going to kill Mr. O'Neill. Uh, 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 but Ms., uh, and like someone who is like more astute would have totally gotten that. But Mr. O'Neill is just such a naive character, he would never have guessed. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, one of the fun things uh, I found out was, um, you know, trying to guess who it is that uh, he, um, that uh, Francis was was going to kill first because it's kind of obvious that if he keeps on escalating like this, um, he's going to have to kill someone. I, I thought that it was going to be the journalist, but uh, mm-hmm. obviously th- that that follows as well. Yeah, but but part of it also is that he's not attached to Mr. O'Neill very much. He, he's, he, he's but he's very attached uh, to Maddie Storenson. He very much does like her, and there's a, a number of very good monologues where he monologues about trust uh, and to what extent. I don't know. I mean, others. isn't he being a bit, a bit sarcastic there? Though? Like, no, he he he's being quite genuine there. Like, this is a little bit from uh the la- from like the start of the second season, but at the start of the second season. He he actually has a bit of I don't know if you want to call it PTSD. He he he, he keeps reliving Maddie's death in his head, and he's really shocked by it, and he feels like he, hmm. he, he's uh, and he feels bad about it, and his wife has to comfort him. It's like, past, it's I past see. Practice. I mean, um, in the first series, at any rate, he does say some that he trusts um, Maddie to to his wife and. I guess we can assume that, um, well, at least for now, for for season one, that he's honest with his wife. Oh yes, uh, he is. He is very much so. Uh, speaking and of, his, so yeah, go on. His wife is simply the type who's like an absolute social climber. She she is like the type that is so addicted to power. And, and working through a man, it's like she is Lady Macbeth to a T. Uh, I mean, and uh, it's very interesting. Again, contrast with this with the U.S. version, where like the U.S. version is like, oh, she's like such a good woman, and she works at a clean water NGO, and oh, like she messes up a little, but she tries to do well, and oh, it's just such a shame that she's. Uh, that that she's married to this evil bastard, and it's like, 
I don't think she end up supplanting her husband or something in the series. Yes, but that only happened because Kevin Spacey got in trouble for pederasty, uh, 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 and they had to kick him off the show. <laughs> it had it had zero to do with any plot writing. Yeah, um, and um, I, I guess it has to be mentioned. Uh, those clips uh, that uh, Kevin Spacey made for YouTube, uh, yeah, he's still playing the character. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, did you see them? Uh, no. no, I don't think so. They're pretty entertaining. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I imagine. But yeah, any, but yeah, the, um, he yeah. has he has to take care of Miss, uh, Mr. O'Neill, but. <laughs> It's interesting with Maddie. Maddie keeps uh, talking with her friend's own friend. And all the evidence points to Frances Urquhart, but she's like quite uh, unreasonably uh, uh, unable to like believe that it's him. There, there's actually a nice line that I like where, where she turns to friend's own friend and she's like, uh, uh, the friend's own friend's basically going, why won't you believe that it's Urquhart? All the po- signs point to it. And and she basically goes, exasperated, can't you tell why? And I don't think he quite gets on what she means by that. <laughs> but she's right, he probably should have got on. Yeah, I mean, but to be fair to him, like, as he points out, uh, Urquhart is, uh, like, t- t- like, the age of of his, uh, yeah, of his 20, father. Of his father. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's like easily twenty years a senior, possibly more. Oh, and uh, I guess we should also mention that the that the wife is fine with it as well. Oh yes, the the wife, in fact, inv- uh, invited Francis to do this, uh, in in order to uh, get her onto <laughs> his side, like. Yeah, she is. That's why I say that she's the ultimate Lady Macbeth. She she's the type where even like fidelity in a marriage doesn't matter to her. What matters to her is her accruing power through her man. Yeah, I, I think in in general, uh, this series that that House of Cards, the British British version, has some good female female representation. Um, I think it's fair <laughs> to say. <laughs> Some very classical female representation, you might say. Not something they would have. Uh, it would have been very unusual to continue it on uh, to the U.S. version uh, to modern Netflix. Right. Um, okay. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, Maddie does start to put all the pieces together. Um, Francis Urquhart also misplays himself by, uh, uh, by going off uh, on, uh, uh, by chewing her out. Oh, I just saw an interesting little, I didn't notice this, the, one of the newspaper bits while, uh, that, uh, that Mrs. Urquhart is reading includes the headline, Samuel's was a gay lib commie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's what that's what the movie says, by the way. No, that's not what uh, what we are saying or anything. Yes, like, yes, <laughs> yes. That 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 is the headline in the newspaper in the in the series. I think that's funny. Yeah. The series, by the way, is still available uh, on um, BBC One, the uh, which is, or rather, the, the BBC on, Online thing. You can you can oh. watch it there. Um, oh, is it? I did not. Yeah, know. but you need to like uh, register on the BBC, so that's why I didn't watch it there. Um, mm-hmm. Pirate Bay is good enough. So naturally, but should... yeah, uh, it ended. Up... And it's actually interesting the way he tops off Maddie is he specifically sets it up as an ambush. He's like sitting there on a high tower. And of course, Maddie at this point has been acting a little paranoid. She's been fired from her job for pushing on the story and whatnot. And she ends up 
uh, asking Francis what this is all about. Is it true that you did all these things? And when he uh, and he does end up confessing to her all his crimes, and he basically tries and to watch her reaction. And when it's pretty clear that she's not along for the ride anymore, she says, "You can trust me." Oh, Maddie, I don't. You don't know how much it pains me to say this, but I don't believe I can. Pushes her off, uh, and, and uh, off the high ledge, and he goes, "Daddy!" Did Did she say that? I can't remember. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's one of those signature bits. Okay, okay. Um, I, I guess I was kind of distracted by seeing this kind of frail-looking old man just lifting up a woman uh, over. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and he's very to a, a very easily played off as she was a little paranoid and, and ended up committing suicide. He's able to play it off that way, and you can see how quite believably he could, given the scenario, given her background, and all. Yeah, that. given that she was fired, it's you know like. And, and, and there's this great ending monologue, where, uh, where he's being driven into to meet the queen at Buckingham Palace, and you hear his comments over the radio, and he's driving in. Uh. And he turns to look at the audience, and as he always does, he says, I have no comment on the matter. No. 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 And and he is acting unusually defensive. He's never acted this defensive before. Uh, and, uh, And he's reacting to, like, these theoretical comments that you might be throwing at him at the TV screen. And, like, there's one where it's like, you might very well think that. I couldn't possibly comment. Uh, and it's, you get the feeling that's almost like in response to the person in the TV calling him like a lo- like a murderer or something like that. So, uh, how, would you, how would you rate this? I'd say this show, in a way, is one of the kind... There aren't very many political dramas like this where just every bit of it, like, uh, obviously there might be some uh, exaggerated bits, like, we don't know, I don't think there are very many murders, political murders, in UK politics at the time, but it's quite possible there were. I really don't know, and I, I don't have the background to know those things. Uh, Michael, maybe Michael Dobbs knew such things. Maybe he didn't. I don't know. But regardless, it's very rare that you get such a show which is both feels so drippingly authentic, and also doesn't feels even handed. Doesn't feel like it's particularly trying to take uh, a political stance. Like okay, there's a few shots at the Tories, but there's also quite a few shots at the Liberal Tories for being, like, weak and whatnot. So, like, it doesn't... And and that's probably why it ended up on that list uh, that the Daily Mail uncovered of, like, oh, if you you, uh, suspected right-wing extremists in the UK uh, watch these shows. Yeah, I, I might put the list in the description for this video. I know. <laughs> yes, it's 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 quite humorous. It's basically uh, a list that states if you are interested in anything historically English or British, uh, you are a potential right wing extremist. Uh, I wonder what that says about the government. Hmm. Hmm. I, I guess what I like about it is that it, at least the first season, is that like uh, it's not a morality play. Like they they could have no. like. They could have like uh, made a, a, a tried to humiliate a, a cat at the end or something, and no, they don't. Every, made, made everything like fall around them um, because, like, uh, I don't know, the, the audience can't uh, and the and, and the writers can't stand like having the bad guy winning or something like that. Mm-hmm. But but there's nothing. I don't know about the the seasons which come later, but in season one at least, 
there's nothing um, like that. No, uh, there, there's there's nothing like that. And, and he ends up uh, winning it all basically by the skin of his teeth. Uh, and like that's again, it's a good drama because like he's everything slowly unraveled, but he manages to patch things up for now. Uh, and uh, o- o- overall, like you- you're right, it doesn't try and make it uh, overly, uh, and it doesn't try to dwell on his crimes too much. Uh, it instead like he himself dwells on it enough and he himself makes it quite clear that he feels uh, his own guilt that he feels for these, but that he justifies it to himself. And and the show is like very much this impartial observer. It's very much like you're just watching it go go all the way through. And, and, And like it's very, very well done. Like, I give this... In terms of enjoyment, I'd say an 8 out of 10. But in terms of, like, how well-made it is, and how well-made it is for a British TV show at the time, uh, I'd have to give it a 9 out of 10 or something like that. And and, and what makes it very nice, uh, this is something that I always value, is it's very direct, it's very to the point, doesn't waste your time. Yeah, it's sort of like like a very long movie. Uh, at least that's what I felt like. Yeah, it is very much like a very long movie. It's like just a little mini series. Yeah, I I watched it in, in a couple of days, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, only the first season, so uh, I've still still more to watch. And from what I've seen so far, in terms of enjoyment, uh, I have to give it. A seven out of ten, honestly, because okay. I like, but it's a, it, it's a strong seven out of ten. Mm. Um, but I, I just didn't feel like there were that many any opponents. Like m- maybe if there was some kind of kind of of, of like it kind of felt well, a little a little bit of like it was or not. But yeah, sorry, what is it? Yeah, that that's what the two, uh, the two subsequent seasons get into more. In the second season, the new king uh, starts openly feuding with uh, the uh, with the prime minister, uh, uh, prime minister Urquhart, and it's actually like this interesting dynamic where, on the one hand, as a Tory, uh, Urquhart should theoretically be deferential to the king, even if he's a liberal, but in reality, Urquhart's like, oh, the king. He he sees the king as almost an anachronism that should like stay away from politics, and yet the the king, because he's somewhat liberal, is able to challenge prime minister. And there's like a good rivalry between the two. Yeah, I, and I guess the, the other thing is that at least in this season, like I, I like I didn't feel like anyone stands for anything. Um, no, and that's very much the point. Uh, you're supposed to get off the feeling. That no one stands very hardly for anything. There are people that might be temperamentally more conservative or whatnot, yeah. but like that's it. Yeah, I, I guess that I sort of don't agree with. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it a mo- the moral, maybe the message, um, like that people don't actually believe in in anything. But but I guess um, at the same time, you can't like you can't actually deny that all of it is. Folds. Uh, I mean, uh, the political murders are a, a little bit. In a, uh, oh yeah. yeah, like I, I, I don't deny for a second that like very much most uh, high-ranking politicians don't believe in anything. Like I mean that, and that's very, very obvious. Like when yeah, you I look th- at them, you way uh, you look at the way they act, you look at the way they talk. Yeah, and, and it- I mean that's always going to be. A little bit more obnoxious and more obvious on the political right than the political left, uh, simply because there's uh, the boundaries of how you can operate on the political right are very constrained. Yeah, I mean, um, but, but I, I mean, it's not. Well, it's not like what they're saying is not true. That like, no. Um, I mean that even if there is a belief, like 
it can all get overtaken by um, individual ri rivalries between um, the leaders. I, I mean, you, you can kind of see it with with DeSantis and Trump. I think. Oh a yeah. Bit, yeah, yeah, they're. Yeah, those two are having a rivalry with one another right now. And like, are, are there any discrete uh, policy differences between the two? Right now, they aren't really articulating everything. And yet they still have this rivalry going between one another. Uh, uh, because both of them s see themselves as potentially jockeying for this position of public yeah. candidacy. Yeah, I, I guess that uh, t temperamentally, um, I like to see stuff um, where, like, yeah, I mean, it's fine to have this Machiavellian stuff, but like, there needs to be some kind of a belief, uh, even if it's something as silly as like fucking a death note or something. Like, let's kill everyone who's bad. Uh, yeah, or something like that, rather than just. Um, but but that's just uh, a, an opinion. Um, for what it is, it is pretty good. Um, but but I can't. But uh, I don't know. Like I can't um, score stuff objectively because at the end, I don't know. My enjoyment is the thing which I care the most when it comes to scores. Uh, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um. All right. I think we can end it yeah. there, unless you have something more to say. No, I think. Uh, yeah, I think it, uh, th that's that's enough. Um, if I can figure out how to make Craig leave, um, that should be it for today. Uh, yeah, I can't figure out how to click Craig. Give me a second, because if I do it the wrong way, I'm worried that, um, um, like the recording might might be gone. Uh, Stop. Okay. It's not...